Wonderful. Thank you, Frank. I'm Charlie Kleisner, and I'm sitting in for a couple of minutes uh, for Bia, who is having some difficulties uh, logging on. So we anticipate that she will join us in a few minutes. And uh, welcome to the uh, panel on driving social innovation. I am very pleased to be here with uh, star panelists, and uh, we'll make the rounds, the intro comments first. And so I'm going to call on each one of you to introduce yourselves a little bit and uh, talk about the topics that are relevant to our discussion. And then we we'll take it um, further from there. So um, why don't we start out with, uh, with uh, Doug and then make the rounds. Doug? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm gonna start with um, a breakfast I had five years ago. Uh, probably one of the most inspirational and important breakfasts of my life. And it wasn't because the breakfast was great and breakfasts are my favorite meals of the day by far. Um, it was a breakfast with Fred Swanaker. Uh, Fred is one of the most inspiring leaders that I'm fortunate to know. Uh, Fred is the founder of African Leadership University, which is on a mission, as I think many people know, to transform education across Africa. At that point, five years ago, his dream was to open 25 high quality new age universities and create the new Harvard for Africa in Africa uh, and educate 3 million African leaders over the next 50 years. I couldn't write notes fast enough. I, uh, I only ate half of my French toast. And if you know anything about me, I always eat all my French toast. Um, it was an important conversation. And what happened, not only was that conversation inspiring, it was honest. We talked about the challenges of building a social venture, how really hard that is. And that building a team with who have the skills to scale and grow is not easy around the world. I had 50 more conversations like the one with Fred before we started RippleWorks. And at RippleWorks, my foundation, we flipped the script. Simply put, we are on a mission to be the most pro-entrepreneur foundation in the world. And we're doing that by relentlessly focusing and understanding the needs of social ventures. Those 50 conversations have been the foundation of RippleWorks. Leaders like Fred told us how their biggest needs center around supporting the growth of their teams, how they're, how they're startups with these young, scrappy, high potential teams, but not many of them have ever scaled a venture before. They had all kinds of operational questions. How to scale a team from five to 50? How to scale your tech architecture as you scale your user base? How do you use digital marketing to scale customer acquisition? That's why RippleWorks, our biggest program, has been centered on targeted, customized operational support that is designed to help teams tackle their top priorities and grow their skills as a result. We leverage startup executives with deeply relevant experience who volunteer their time to work with these social ventures on high impact custom design projects. Five years later, we've now done this 150 times like what we did with ALU on their digital marketing strategy, African Leadership University in 60 different countries. Our focus on customers didn't stop with understanding projects. Three years ago, we became a funder. So now we have the opportunity to help social ventures with financial capital. Before we ever gave away $1, we organized a series of dinners with social ventures, CEOs, and presidents to hear directly from them, what do you like and not like about funders? What would you change? If you had to dream up your own funder, what would that look like? Again, I filled up notes of pages, and in fact, one of the women who is a president of an organization attending one of these dinners now is our managing director of investments. We are the funder that entrepreneurs dream of because we directly were designed by entrepreneurs. And that's the point that I wanna make is to be relentlessly focused on the needs of social ventures that will drive the most change and most impact. And that's what RippleWorks is relentlessly focused on every day. Thank you so much, Doug. That is so great. How about Esther? Tell us about what motivates you in social innovation? It's a grab mic. 
I'm used to Zoom, but not to this one. Uh, I started out as a tech person. I also had training in journalism and transparency and facts and on Wall Street. And then in around 2013, I had started to become an angel investor. I was investing in healthcare and suddenly I realized, why are we spending so much money fixing people who shouldn't be broken in the first place? And I thought somebody should just do a project like at XPRIZE for health as opposed to health care. And I was going to give a speech. Somebody should do this. And I realized that's a really terrible speech as opposed to, I'm going to do this. So in 2014, I announced what is now Wellville, which is a 10-year nonprofit project. And that's very carefully designed. It's not a foundation or it's, it's not designed to last. It's designed not to give people fish forever or to teach them how to fish, but to help five small communities build their own fishing schools. These are communities in the U.S. They have a lot of resilience and, and strong people in them, but they have very little money and all kinds of problems. And we are basically coaching them to make the communities healthier places. And at the end of the 10 years, which will be in 2024, my goal is to use them to inspire other communities to do the same thing, to inspire the United States government and its voters to pay to invest in health instead of renting health and then spending a lot of money after the fact trying to fix what went wrong with health care. So that's, that's my mission. And my second mission is to see if we can't get Bia back. <laughs> um, something's floating up the side of the screen. Is that Bia? <laughs> yes, she wants the mic. I'm going to click on it and see if she gets... Okay, Bia. Oh, um, that is excellent. Renting health care. If that's not the comment. Okay, see, um, and, and think about... Are you Renting health care, if that's not the way we, um, that's, that's really something to kind of walk through and, and think about. So Charlie, you've really inspired me, kind of understanding the way you've brought people together and think about the world and even capitalism, huge thoughts. Can you come, tell us about yourself and, and what you're doing? Oops, yes, absolutely. Sorry, I had to turn it on. So um, thank you, Pia, and I'm so glad you're, you're back. So um, <laughs> thanks for being here. And I, I'm, I'm a deep impact practitioner. Um, and what we do is we uh, take a systemic view of, uh, of the big issues of our times, like inequality, social injustice, and climate change, but with a level of consciousness and awareness that goes beyond our own ego, beyond my own benefit, that is in service to humanity and the planet. So I'm a technologist. I have a PhD in computer science. I know a lot about uh, large distributed systems, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. Immigrated to Silicon Valley 35 years ago, worked in three successful startups that created significant wealth for me and my family. So we had to ask the question about the meaning of wealth. For my wife, Lisa, and I, the meaning of wealth goes hand in hand with the responsibility to make a positive contribution to humanity and the planet. We also recognize that we have been benefiting from the existing system and that we contribute to this system knowingly and unknowingly. And we could not possibly buy into the narrative of doing a little bit more good with our philanthropy while doing a whole lot of damage and bad with most of our other investments. So we really did not have a choice but to align our investments with our values. So I left Silicon Valley 20 years ago to focus on what is now called impact investing. And I've been going deeper and deeper in the last three years, particularly into what I call deep impact investing, which is systemic in nature. And it takes a non-human centric and non-anthropocentric approach to investing with an awareness that humans are not somehow outside of the system, outside of evolution, but really part of it. And modern technology is also playing a role in enabling the big transition towards a more just and healthy planet, particularly the tokenization of impact artificial intelligence, blockchain, and the Internet of Things. All this has become even more important, in my opinion, in the context of COVID-19 and the massive ESG movement that has been taking off. COVID-19 has 
sometimes brutally, shown the structural and systemic issues like racism, inequality, broken global supply chains, and so on and so forth. And ESG is a convenient effort for the people in control of the existing system to not only perpetuate it, but to use ESG to continue to maximize their profits at all costs. Even if all the money in the world would flow into ESG, inequality and social injustice would get worse, and climate change would not be mitigated in time to avoid major disruptions. That is why deep impact is so important to go beyond the pervasive grain and impact washing of our times. So today, I'm working on the intersection of impact consciousness and technology. And uh, to finish my introductory comments, I want to point out that we actually know what has to be done to migrate from the current extractive economy to deep impact economy. Number one, we need to redesign our economic and financial system according to the principles that we know, like uh, circularity, regionality, resiliency, and regeneration. Number two, we need to massively scale new systemic approaches towards impact investing, including pay for success, tokenization of impact, plenty capital, radical democratization, and new data ownership models. And last but not least, we all need to do our part as consumers, investors, and with our lifestyle choices. Wow. Thank you. So we have a, a big way to impact just in where we're putting our money and um, we don't have to wait till we're uber wealthy to make a difference, I think is one of the things you're helping us see. That's great. So it, um, Charlie was talking about impact specifically in COVID and Miriam, you've told me some impressive stories about what you've been able to do helping corporations during COVID before and after or and continually. Tell us a little bit about what motivates you and how you're working. Miriam? I don't, can you grab the mic? Is that me? Are you talking to me? I'm having, oh, sorry about that. Can you guys hear me? I'm having scenes, internet bandwidth issues. You, you can hear okay, great. And you look lovely. Um, okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, good evening, morning, everyone. Though you're frozen, I'm going to assume that you can hear me, as you said. So I'm Mariam Robinson. I actually, I grew up in Jamaica, uh, and I spent probably half of the time living in Jamaica, half my time living in the United States. I went off to college and work um, as a strategy consultant for a number of years, eight years in fact. Then I did private equity investing in the Caribbean, so back in emerging markets. And now I am in a CEO role at a commercial bank back in Jamaica, my home country. And, you know, I, I've all along, just based on um, my background and just the environments I've been in, it's been very important to me to always be giving back because a lot of my success has been about the educational opportunities afforded to me as a young person growing up in an emerging market. But more specifically, what I wanted to talk about today, and I won't talk now in the intro, but just to, to put out there, is the whole idea about the role of corporations in driving social innovation. Oftentimes we think because we may work for a for-profit company, like say I do, um, that about the numbers, and it's not necessarily about the broad set of stakeholders or environment that we live in. And so I think purpose is becoming more and more front and center for corporations, which I'm so happy to see. So it's not just about profit and people and now planet, but also purpose. And what we did during COVID, given the true um, inequality that was put front and for all of us to see across the world in different ways. Um, I work for a bank which has been focused on financial inclusion. And this pandemic that we're going through now just forced us to really go much faster getting people into the formally. People have been most disadvantaged in my country, Jamaica, by the pandemic has been those that have less access, better environment for all and all can reach their full potential. So for us, the way it manifested in this moment is about getting more persons into the formal financial system, financial inclusion, and I'm happy to talk more about that later. So I'll just stop there. That's so great. Thank you. And I know one of the things you and I had talked about is this idea of just innovation and creativity. And one of the things we talked about is sometimes we think of those things as um, not connected to money. Uh, but, but what I think we came up with is nothing ignites 
creativity like prosperity and nothing squelches it like poverty. So if we can give access to capital, it's amazing where the world can go. So uh, I don't think we've heard from uh, Chevy yet. And there, I see a shadow. Hi, what gets, tell us about you. Hi, how are you? Uh, so I'm based in Malaysia. So I went schooling in the UK and US. I work as a banker and now I, subsequently I run my family business in healthcare. Now I run a medical technology company based out in Southeast Asia. So the company is in five countries, namely Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Indonesia. So our job is to connect patient and healthcare providers. So i.e. something like an Uber of healthcare. Great, thank you. So what I'd love to do is, I know that when we're doing some hard work, there's like these moments where we think, oh, is it all worth it? And then something happens. We impact someone's life and we say, this is why I do what I do. Charlie, tell us about one of those moments. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that uh, the challenges of our times require the uh, unlikely allies to cooperate and collaborate, you know, across mm -hmm. different uh, regions, across different age groups, across different ethnicities, across as much diversity as possible. And science is catching up with us that that's uh, necessary. And so when I get a chance to actually co-create with others, you know, these what we call, for instance, deep impact circles, where we become very vulnerable and explore topics like, um, you know, what's our contribution to the badness of the system? How much is enough for us privileged ones, mm -hmm. which I am part of that tribe, right? Then um, if we have a real conversation about that, that goes deeper into the soul level of conversation, as opposed to just talking intellectually, you know, that's what's exciting. And it's particularly exciting if I get to talk to young people, to people in different regions of different age groups of different uh, backgrounds. And, um, and there is, you know, it's so great to see that this is emerging now, Bia. It's not just, it could not happen top down. Nobody could design it that way. Nobody's smart enough to do that. And it's very gratifying for me to see that we are not the only ones, but we are contributing to this emergence of consciousness, awareness, and deep impact and questioning the status quo and wanting to do things very differently than um, looking back and extrapolating out linearly. We're at the step function right now and uh, it deserves a different approach. Excellent, thank you. How about you, Esther? What was a moment when you said, wow, we've impacted this person's life. This is why we do what we do. You have to grab the mic, I think. You. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Um, we work mostly with the leaders. Uh, I wouldn't be very useful walking in the streets of Muskegon telling people about nutrition or healthy behavior. But what's happening right now, and I'm in the middle of it, which is exciting, is as, as in so much of America and so much of the world, diabetes is a huge problem. And in theory, we know how to prevent it. It's, it's mostly a question of diet, you need exercise and, and a few other things. But it's, it's very hard to do because we evolved as human beings to live in scarcity and now we, we live in too much abundance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is not a new idea, but suddenly there's some real interest in the community in doing something about it. There's, you know, just, the YMCA is now running a diabetes prevention program with a grant from the CDC. The health project, which is connected to the healthcare system, is interested. And so it's my job as the, the coach to get Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is the insurance company. And I'm, I'm telling you this in real time. It hasn't happened yet. I'm, I'm in the middle of trying to organize an appointment with their VP of Government Affairs, I have another connection who's introduced me to the guy who runs Western Michigan for Blue Cross Blue Shield, and finally a third one through the president to whom I hope to get to the people who, who do the payment systems. And, you know, this is, it's, it's like I'm 
trying to juggle these things and I'm not in charge. I don't want to be in charge. The community needs to ask for it. And then the pitch to the insurance company is, hey, here's a community. It's going to make your program successful because the community is asking for it. It's not you pushing it on them. And so I hope I will look back in a year and say, you know, that time I was on the Horace's this conference and talking about it, that was right in the middle of when everything was starting to come together. Uh, that's what I live for. It's, it's like being the catalyst, not being the owner. And, you know, it's, it's like raising children. You, you can't motivate them. You have to somehow help them motivate themselves. And uh, excellent. Thank you. And I appreciate you talking specifically about diabetes. Uh, and I think today, as we've lost so many people to COVID, yes. that's a direct example of a pre-existing condition that, you know, what was what was that tragedy? Was it this illness or that, the combination? And so there's a lot of pain right now in the world. It, it, it's exacerbated in a way that it wasn't two years ago. Yeah, no, I mean, and people are noticing, people don't die of diabetes, but they die faster of something else because they have diabetes. And it's, everybody dies, but diabetes makes you die sooner. And that's, and, and you have a horrible, you have a lot of challenges while you're still alive too. Doug, tell us about you from one of those moments where you said, we're going to work at this even harder because we're making an impact. Share our story. Yeah, I'd say the thing that gets me most depressed and is hard for me to overcome is evil people. And that's when I'm at my bottom. Uh, and so uh, there's a, a project we worked on in Syria um, where there's obviously a lot of war. And we're the ones who help organizations overcome their biggest challenge. And an organization was trying to protect the ceasefire in Syria. And to be able to pull that off, they needed some new technology integrated into microphones to be able to detect planes taking off from airfields as well as gunfire and to understand that direction. And uh, so we could report that to the UN and then they could bring in troops. The first time that went live, um, after hearing the atrocities of people being killed from these bombings and the breaking of the ceasefire, gave me back the faith of what we were doing, that um, the goodness over, over the evil. So that's what gets keeps me going is when we can overcome the evil people. What, thank you. A, amazing work. And B, for reminding us how, um, how big the hurdles are and how easy it would be to say, forget it, let's not do anything because I can't make enough of an impact. But you really tell a great story is because the hurdles are big, we we have to just walk forward. And um, yeah. that, that's really excellent. So um, Chevy, give us a story where you saw a spark in an eye and you said, this is why we do what we do. Yeah, so uh, two, two main things, right? So one, one of the thing is dengue. Dengue is a big thing in this part of the world, the small mosquito biting, right? And it cleans people's life too. So I have a near, I have a friend who have near death experience that needed to seek medical help. And uh, he reached out to me and I managed to get it for him. But I think that healthcare should be accessible, right? Not just because someone knows me, then I can make a special arrangement. That's number one. Number two, uh, my family went health. So the longer I am in the health business, I realize I get more phone calls from people asking for opinion, which are the better doctors, which are the most reasonably priced. And I told myself, I have a full-time job. I'm not a call center, right? So why can't I digitize it and have something like a Trabago, Agoda, or price line of an equivalent, right? Then that's how I, I started Book Dog. And also over time from just connecting patient and healthcare provider. We also realized that in my country, we have the most obese population in the whole of Asia. And is the, the reason is because of the food consumption that, you know, a few months back, I was with the PepsiCo uh, CEO of APAC. They were just mentioning how could the condensed milk in Malaysia increase when the income level increase, it should be the reverse. When the income level of a country increases, the condensed milk would 
consumption would drop, they will substitute for more superior product or healthier product like low fat, skim milk, etc. Right? But it's just the nature of our food type that it goes up. So it's really an anomaly for PepsiCo as well. So what we did here was we want to gamify where we actually reward people for staying active. And we have about 5,100 reward merchants currently as we speak in 12 countries to help hopefully gamify and reverse the trend of the non-communicable disease. Great. Thank you. What an impact. Miriam. Yes. Tell us a story about when you just realized this is why we're doing what we're doing. Yes, where I felt really fulfilled and moved. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about the something different from healthcare, actually, on finance and access to finance capital. Um, the statistics are that over 30% of persons in most emerging markets do not have access to the formal financial system. What that means, actually, and most of us here do, so we don't. Have, it's hard to have a perspective for what that means. But things like having a bank account having the ability to make payments outside of just the exchange of cash, having the ability to save a pension plan. There are so many people in this world who are underbanked or banked and they don't have access to good rates, savings, pension, etc. And so our bank, being one of the more innovative and smaller banks in our current sector, we said we are going to go in and disrupt the market. People have this view that when you serve underprivileged or poor people, you can't make money. So therefore, it's not the role of the for-profit company to do that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the more you have people living what I call underground and who are getting um, mistreated with high rates, you know, these predatory lending rates, etc., is the more you have unintended negative consequences in society. And of course, COVID has taught us that we have to consider all persons around us, not just our immediate circle. So for our bank, I was very proud because we did this. With, I guess we went out into the community and spoke to persons who had just gotten a bank account. And with a bank account comes a, de a Visa debit card. I mean, again, a bank card, something as we take for granted. But most people really have to transact with cash. Um, and I was very proud because for the first time, we were able to disrupt the banking industry in Jamaica and open bank accounts for over 10,000 Jamaicans. Right, using what we call the account opening requirements in a reduced manner. And we got the central bank to come on board and then other banks actually started marketing their products even though they didn't open as much as many other products. But I just felt good that persons could now save. Someone who's a household helper, that's a role that we have in emerging markets. I guess it's the equivalent of a nanny in the developed markets, right? Um, usually you pay the nanny cash. And the nanny who was paid cash has to give you know, money to her children, you know, when she's saving the money, people come and ask her for money. Now that money sits in the bank. And so she has to actually make an effort to go to an ATM or to the bank to pull the money out, or she can use her card at a, at a firm or a retail store to pay. Just that little change where there was so much resistance from a mindset standpoint from colleagues, even at my own company. Um, when COVID hit, we said we have to get people more into the banking system because persons could not go out and buy food and buy essential services as easily because now they're putting their health at risk. So I felt very proud about that. And I really believe that corporations really need to think about, it's not just about the bottom line. It's not just about shareholders. It really is about the community that we're living in and what is that social goodwill and innovation that we are creating. And most social outcomes I find that have really high impact, it comes from innovative thinking, out of the box thinking. Once you're addressing a need, the capital will so thank you. That's amazing. And what's really interesting is so often we hear the story of the major, or not major, but a, a telecom company making a great exit or um, TV or, or, or someone who was willing to go in a market that was underserved or was outstretched. And those people make a ton of money because, because there had been such a margin of taking advantage. And so um, I love where your heart is, uh, I, and I love that there's room for growth and that that's not a bad thing, that there's an opportunity to serve. So we have people here, we're all interested in social innovation. A lot of times we take this long view, 
something we've done for 10 years or 20 years or the impact we're making. What would we say to someone paying attention, listening to us now? What can they do this week? There, there's a question, there's a passion, there's a curiosity about making a difference. And, and I want to know what advice would you say, here's what I recommend you do this week to act on that. Let's start with you, Esther. Thing you always have to do is unmute before you can do anything good. Yeah. Um, in a way, I think there's very little you can do this week other than start today instead of tomorrow. Uh, you can, you know, you can, you can ameliorate somebody's pain. You can give them some money to buy food, but in order to make real change, you have to start now because it's going to take a long time. Uh, you, you know, you need to figure out what you want to do. You need to understand what the problem is. You need to explore the root causes rather than just the impact. Uh, but you need to be prepared to spend, in, in my case, 10 years. Uh, okay. It's, you know, because fixing the results is not what I think most of us are trying to do. We're, we're trying to fix the causes. And right. institutions that simply change the world. Thank you. That is excellent. Tevi, what kind of advice would you give for someone saying, gosh, I want to be able to make an impact. What would you say? Go do this this week. I think at the end is follow your own passion, right? What you're passionate about and whether you have the core competency to do it or go to some mentor or some friends to say, hey, let's why, why not we join forces and do something together, right? Great. See who you're surrounding yourself with and go meet other people. That's that's excellent. Doug, how about you? What's your advice for someone to move forward this week? Yeah, I'm going to give a different answer because I'm looking at who's here right now. And it looks like people who have already committed to do something in social impact or social innovation. So I'm going to give an answer of what can you do this week if you're already interested in something and working on something. And that is be brutally honest. Be brutally honest with yourself what is the biggest challenge that you're facing? And oftentimes we'll put the biggest challenges at the bottom of our to-do list because we can get through the other things. If you're brutally honest with what's your biggest challenge, put it at the top, don't focus on the other things, and go do something about that biggest challenge, even if it's just to put a plan together. Excellent. Thank you. Charlie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, impact investing is still to a large part um, uh, an activity for more affluent people, for more wealthy people. And yet I do believe that anybody can actually influence the financial system by if they are banked. And um, Miriam just explored, uh, you know, how some people are not banked. Asking that question elevates the awareness and the consciousness of all the players, including the banks, right? Same as if you, if you are in a pension, you know, if you live in the north and, and some people in the south as well, they uh, do get a pension plan. And ask what the pension managers are using the money for in order to support the, 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 the world that your grandkids are living in or to destroy by, by financing again, you know, the destruction that's uh, going on in, in the ex extractive economy and with your lifestyle you can you can play uh, you can do choices any day you know you make choices about what you wear what you drive what you eat where you where you travel to and all of this and that has an impact as well don't believe the existing storyline the existing storyline does not serve us anymore it's important to be part of the new storyline the new storyline that does not want to go back to business as usual that messes up the planet that uh, that creates inequality and social injustice, but we need to co-create the storyline of a sustainable future for the planet and all of us, um, not just um, a few of us. And the way to do that is to work on yourself. In turbulent times particularly, you need to be strong and courageous in order to um, 
not be driven by fear. And the, and a lot of the politicians, a lot of the press, a lot of the media is obsessed with augmenting our fears as opposed to the other way around. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that you can really counter that by strengthening your own resolve, how you see the world, what you do with you, what, what, what you do with it. You see that the, your life is a direct expression of who you are internally, right? And if you're a very anxious person, then it will reflect in what you do. And being equanimous, being joyful, being courageous, being able to see the truth is you can practice that. Just like you can practice um, getting stronger in your body, you can practice getting stronger in your soul. And that would be my one advice to anybody. You can start your mindfulness journey just, just by reflecting or by doing yoga, by doing meditation, by walking, by, by talking to dear friends. And, and you don't have to be a, a meditator in order to do that. So that would be my advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's um, great. A simple thing like asking a question. Wonderful idea. And then just also the, the what we focus on today decides who we bring into our world and how we can work with them. And, and that we don't have to wait a week for that. We can do that in this minute. So, um, uh, Miriam, tell us about what advice you have. From yeah, the so media. Oh, that question. Yeah, I love that question. I hope you guys can hear me. I'm, I'm having internet mm -hmm. challenges. But um, so if I if I thought about the next seven days, um, I like what has been said, and I would just add to that, uh, especially what Charlie just said. I would add to that to say, let's just pick right now a problem that is a burning issue for you. Um, it doesn't have to be something you're working on through your day-to-day -day job, and it doesn't have to be something that you've started working on yet, or it can be something you already have started. And I would say just go into a quiet place, carve out on your calendar, whatever it might be, and just put down what is that burning issue right now and what are all the reasons why it has not been solved or resolved. And then from there, as you think about ideas, then you could actually bring folks, just friends, onto a Zoom call and just say, I just want to talk for 40 minutes or 35, you know, not an hour. Just to, I just want to talk about this issue and I just want to brainstorm it like we have no obstacles, like no capital constraints, no family like pulling on you like I have young kids. None of that. Like we're just going to brainstorm for 40 minutes, like what we're going to do to solve this issue of, for example, in my country, I know a lot of students are home. And that with people being home, there's a lot more depression and mental health issues, even with persons who are well adjusted. Right there. There is the teenage girl who has broken up with her boyfriend. And who is she going to tell? Someone on Zoom? You know, although they do chat a lot on social media. And so I just had this idea of we should do something for our children. And suddenly we're doing a helpline. And suddenly we're doing it through the private sector organization and UNICEF and the Children's Advocate. And we're literally rolling this out in May from um, Child's Month. And that came from this whole burning issue around the fact that people are on lockdown and the things that are happening to young girls and young women. That's where it actually started for me, just thinking about that. And so I think if you just have that space where you set out the hour to say, here are the obstacles, and then brainstorm with a few people, I come at this from the perspective of where there is a need, there is a way to get it implemented, funded, or funded and implemented. And in fact, usually finding the funds is actually not the harder part. The harder part is getting a team and getting an organization behind you to actually roll it out. So thanks for that question, because I was like, what should I think about for the next few days <laughs> beyond what we're already doing? So thank you. Sure. Well, we got some great advice. Uh, I want to talk one about one of Doug's comments about being really honest and putting our energy in. And something that I do, I'm very visual, is I work with all sorts of entrepreneurs and, and myself included. I kind of find if I think about what I need to work on, all of those things, it almost start if you think about it as a pie chart, there's all these uh, jobs and responsibilities and things that need to be addressed. And if I think about my time like that, I start to spin like a roulette wheel and I can feel like it's spinning out of time. And wherever that darn marble lands, it's like, oh, that's where my energy goes. And so I find that um, to Doug's point, that if I can move my roulette wheel to a bullseye target, I still get to get my eight activities but there's the most important ones get right in the center and they get first attention. And then those other ones are my concentric circles on the outside. That really helps me to uh, 
get some positive momentum and run at something that helps us to, to really uh, make a difference. So uh, the little visual for me is from the roulette wheel to the bullseye target. And um, thank you. We only have about five minutes left. So if we could in a minute kind of wrap up thinking about this bullseye, what's your one point of what's a statement where you say a year from now, this is going to be something different. This is going to be a change that you see because of the work that you're doing in this year. What am I going to hear from you next uh, March 18th in 2022? Uh, an accomplishment, some energy that you've spent in that in that year. Um, let's uh, start with you, Miriam. I just finished up with you. Why don't you start on this one? You're on mute. Miriam? I don't know if she can hear me. You, you must be frozen. Yeah. Uh, no, we can't sorry, hear you. What was the question, Bea? Sorry. The, the question is, uh, you, in one year, where is your energy going to go? What's your accomplishment in this coming year? What's what's going to be the difference? What's the success going to be like for you one year from now? So you can move to someone else. I can't, I can't okay. put the question fully yet. Charlie. Charlie, oh, talk about Okay, great. Uh, so in in one year, I hope that uh, I will have made a big contribution or a small contribution, whatever contribution I can, to not snapping back to business as usual. I do not want to go back to the old system. I do not want to go back to the, to the oppression and to the inequality and social injustice. It's not what we want as a, as a humanity. We need to be more courageous than that, and I hope to make my little contribution to this, to imagine the future and not just hang on to the past. And so I'm working with young people. I'm working with uh, these circles that I'm talking about. I give workshops and seminars to influence and inspire maybe as many people to imagine a different future than just back to business. Mm -hmm. running forward we could be slipping back and so it needs to be very active we, that's we will we actually we will. will slip back right and, and that's very and i'm very scared about this because once that um you know these uh, polarizations start resulting in violence it's very difficult to put it back in, in, into a box right and uh, and so we all need to i think we all need to contribute to the opposite and not be um echo chambering you know just our tribe and so make a conscious decision not to do that, yeah. Doug, what about you and your, give us a year yeah, out. A year from now, so that we're helping social ventures. And so uh, what we have found is the biggest thing holding back social ventures is their talent is able to grow as fast as they are growing. CEOs have access to professional development. Their teams do not. A year from now, we will have fundamentally up helped upskill the teams of these social ventures through all the work that we're doing at RippleWorks. Excellent. That is really good. Esther? Um, I sort of prefigured this, but a year from now, I hope that not only the people who were engaged in, quote, diabetes prevention programs, but their families, their neighbors, the people around them, that it will, you don't need to sign up to live in a healthier community it has an impact on you anyway. And I hope that will have become apparent. Thank you. Chevy? Miriam, can you hear us now? Can you contribute? Miriam, no? Okay. What about you, Bea? What, what's your... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I had just published a book about um, people skills. And I always thought that people skills were these things like, why would someone publish a book about that? And what's been really amazing to me is I learned my people skills not from moving to 13 different homes, not because I attended a business school, but because I was a parent. And one of the things I notice is I feel that parenting people uh, hide that, that skill, that experience from their work life. So one of the things I like to do 
is just help people give themselves credit for all of the places they've been, for the networks that they're building, the the experiences that they're having. And um, in the end, it's people skills that I think really drive our collaborations and our connectivity and our uh, impact. And wherever you're picking those up, I want you to give yourself credit for that because that allows us to make big change. Um, and so, if it's parenting, great. I want to. What I say is, I like to validate that as an important rung on the jungle gym of our careers. Our careers are not linear ladders. Cheryl uh, Sandberg taught us that, but parenting is a viable spot on that jungle gym, and um, was one of my most important spots. And so. a lot of people, I think, discovered that both from your book and from their experiences this year. Of course.